Okay gang, now that we've gone through one problem for reals, let's try this next one and really try and lock down all of the notation, all of the variables, the process we're going through. And with any of these problems coming out of chapter eight, the first thing you wanna figure out is which land you are in. So am I in proportion land or mean land? And let's look for clues in the wording of the problem that help us figure out which land we are in. So it says an AP article on potential violent behavior reported the results of a survey of 750 workers who were employed full time. Of those surveyed, 125 indicated that they were so angered by a coworker during the past year that he or she felt like hitting the person but didn't. Assuming that it is reasonable to regard this sample of 750 as a random sample from the population of full time workers, we can use this information to construct an estimate of P the true proportion of full-time workers so angered in the last year that they wanted to hit a colleague. So we're being tasked with to construct a 90% confidence interval for P, and then we're also being asked to interpret this interval and interpret this level. All right, so the first thing that I wanna do is figure out what land I'm in. And I would say there are a couple of clues for that. Now again, you can always break this down to um, was my variable numerical or categorical? And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, that way of sorting out the problem, but I also just want to talk about a couple of the words in this question that give it away. So here I see the word proportion. Right? That is a great clue that I'm in proportion land. And I also see this the P right here. So those are fantastic clues that we're in proportion land, so we should just take that in. So let me go ahead and off on my margins here, I'm gonna write prop land. Oops, I made that one word. All right, so we'll write prop land, and the other thing that you'll always see me write on my margins here, or just off to the side, um, I'll, I'll then talk about what kind of critical value letter I'm gonna have, and I'm gonna have a Z star critical value letter. And I, I mentioned this, even though we haven't done a mean problem together, it's just good to, to get into this habit. Once I figure out what land I'm in, I remind myself which critical value letter I'm going to use for my, for my confidence interval. And we're only in chapter eight right now, which is great. And in chapter eight, not chapters eight and nine, we'll only deal with one sample at a time. So we only took this, we only ran this survey once, right? We, we took this one sample of 750. And yes, I, I admit that the sample size is 750, but we only did the one sample. So I'm just gonna take note of that in here, okay? Now, if we didn't see these clues, that's fine. We could also think about what was the variable. What was I keeping track of for these 750 people? So the variable in this case is the number of full-time workers that were so angered in the last year they wanted to hit a colleague, right? And you can think of this as I am asking these 750 people, did you want to hit a colleague last year? So yes, they wanted to, no, they didn't, right? So um, whether or not employee wanted to hit coworker, right? And you can see this is categorical. So ultimately I'm gonna turn this into a frequency, right? I'm gonna keep track of the number who said yes to this question. And I'm, I'm curious about the yes just based on how they worded this, right? We wanted to keep track of the folks that were that angry. Right? Now, this is a categorical variable. And anytime we have a categorical variable, we're ultimately gonna turn something into a proportion because that's what we do. We keep track of the frequencies, the number of folks who say yes, because we're deeming yes as a success in this case, and we turn it into a proportion. Now, just before we get going, let's see what the sample proportion was. Let's see what P prime was equal to. So again, proportions, ratios, relative frequencies, fractions. All right, so it looks like 125. I had 125 successes out of 750 trials. So let me go get my calculator and let's just see what this P prime number is equal to. 
Oops, let me clear that out. It looks like we have about 17%. So I'll, I'll go three decimals today. I'll go 0.167. All right. So just imagine if, and I don't know what the margin of error is just yet because we haven't calculated it. But if I had, if this was about 17%, let's say we had a 3% margin of error or even a, two, let's go 2%, right? I think my confidence interval is gonna be somewhere between 15 and 19. And again, I am just straight making that number up right now. I, I don't know what the, the answer will be, but that's that's about it. That This is a statistic based off of our 750 folks. I don't wanna run the census. I don't wanna to talk to all workers. Um, so I'm just gonna give myself a little wiggle room, a little margin of error. We're gonna calculate this number. It's usually when you're in proportion land, your margin of error is about two, three, four percent. Right? That, that Those are pretty common. Um, margins of error. So I think ultimately I'm going to have numbers between 15 and 19, but but let's go see what I'm going to get. All right. So with that, we have a process for this. And I've outlined the process before, but let's let's bring it back. And we're going to do all of this mostly by hand, and then we'll do our shortcut on our calculator. But our, our general workflow is to always check your assumptions, give me a title, construct the interval, and then interpret the interval. And then I put the S in parentheses because you should always interpret the confidence interval and then only do the level if I ask it of you. And we're, we're gonna do the level today just to just keep on practicing this. All right, so with all this, let's check our assumptions. All right, so I'm gonna put here, the first thing I gotta do is check assumptions. All right, and the first assumption for a confidence interval in proportion land is to get a random sample or a sample that represents your population. So it's at this point I want to take us to a, a different flow chart that I've created for us. So if you go into your Canvas files, you'll see something about um, summary of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So on the front page of this is all the stuff that you're going to need for confidence intervals. So if we just take a look from left to right as we start to move through this, right, the, the confidence intervals for means are on the top, confidence intervals for proportions are on the bottom. We haven't done the means yet, so let's just ignore that for right now. All right, but the next part of this, because we're on the proportions down here, this is the actual formula. We'll use that in a little bit, all right? But I also wrote next to us, or next to this, all of the assumptions that we'll need. And this was written on a previous page, but I also just put it in this, um, this trait table just so we'd have it for reference um, at all times. So if I, if I look at this, right, our assumptions in proportion land, the first one was, did I have a random sample or did my sample represent my population? Well, let's see if we could figure one of those out. And this is not the deal breaker assumption, right? This one is the deal breaker assumption. So let's see what we got. So as I sift through this, did I have a random sample or a sample that represents a population? So it says it right here, assuming that it is reasonable to regard this sample as random, right? So I'm gonna put, I was told I had a random sample. Okay, and I'll put a little check mark by it. Great. So let's see what our second assumption is so that I can check this off. All right, so again, if I'm in proportion land, it says um, the counts of successes and failures are both 10, all right? And these counts verify the use of the normal approximation. So we need n p prime and n times one minus p prime to both be greater than or equal to 10. So I'm gonna write those two formulas down and then we're gonna plug them in. So I need n p prime, I need n times one minus p prime. All right, so let's see what we have here. My sample size was 750. My sample proportion was 0.167, if you want to round as a decimal. You could also have actually written the exact fraction, 125 over 750. So we have 750 times the complement here. And let's see what these numbers are equal to. Now, depending on if you use the decimal approximation or the actual fraction, you're going to get two different numbers. And here's what I mean. So let me clear this out. Let's say I did 750 times 0.167. You get about 125.25. But imagine if you used the exact sample proportion, right? So if I did 750 times the sample proportion of 125 out of 750, 
I'm gonna get the exact number because you can see those denominators are about to cancel. So keeping that in mind that these numbers, these successes and failures should be whole numbers because this is what's happening inside of our sample, I'm gonna write 125 here. Okay, and now when I do the complement, if I do 750 times one minus this sample proportion of 125 over 750, you see I'm gonna get 625. And again, if you were using the decimal approximation, that's fine. You're just gonna, oops, not 167. Let me do 167. You're just gonna get a slightly different number, right? So you see when you use the decimal approximation, you get decimals back. When you use the exact value, you get exact numbers. You get whole numbers back. You get your frequency counts back. Either way, these are both greater than or equal to 10. So let's talk about what these mean now in context. So we have 125 successes and 625 failures. And just as a note, right, if I take 125 and I add 625 to it, you get 750. And if you had added the decimal approximations, you also would have gotten 750. Your successes and failures should always total out to your sample size. But what does this mean? What does a success mean in this case, right? It was the number of folks in my sample that wanted to hit a colleague, right? So 125 people of my 755, or not 755, excuse me, of my 750, 125 of those wanted to hit a colleague. So by complement, that meant 625 did not. Okay, great. So we got our second assumption, our most important one checked off. All right, the third assumption that's gonna come out at us is that sample size is small relative to our population. And let's go ahead and just work that up here. So if I wanna take a look at that, let's take our sample size and multiply it by 10, all right? So when I do this, this would be 7,500, right? We're gonna use that 10% rule. And it is safe to assume that there are more than 7,500 full-time workers out there in the real world, right? So let me write, it is safe to assume there are more than 7,500 full-time workers. Right. I'll put a little happy face. And what this means is we can sample without replacement. I don't have to select somebody from whoever, however we were getting these, this sample from the, pop, the pool of full-time workers and then replace them. I can just go on to the next. But what that means is down here, I'm gonna write sample size small relative to population. Right? And you see my supporting work up here. Okay, so we've got that going on. All right, so we've checked our assumptions. That means we can move forward with the problem. I don't need to stop the problem for any reason. All right, and now we've got to do our title. So for your title, you should tell me what land you're in, how many samples you have, and what critical value letter you're going to use. Okay, so we'll do, and we'll, I usually go by order of number, of number of samples, what land you're in, and what critical value you're going to use. All right, so what I mean by that is if I, let me scoot this up just a bit so we can see it. I'll, I'll, I'll take our sample size small work out of the picture. So here, again, I only had the one sample. And my sample size was 750, but I only ran this survey once. So I had one sample. I was in proportion land. And I am doing a Z star confidence interval, okay? So that's what I'm working with here. One sample, proportion land, Z star, confidence interval. And even though we haven't gotten to mean land yet, basically the only tweaks you're gonna see on it in this chapter is this word would change to mean, and this is gonna change to something called T star, okay? So those are your two variations inside of chapter eight. All right, so I've got my assumptions checked. I've got my title. The next thing I wanna do is construct the interval and then we'll interpret. All right, so when I wanna go construct, excuse me, the interval, it means I wanna use this formula. 
All right, so let me go copy this directly onto my paper, and then we're gonna fill in our numbers for our particular problem. All right, so here we go. Let's do the confidence interval is P prime plus or minus a margin of error. Okay, I'll just write that this was the title over here. Okay, so your confidence interval, the, the general format for it is you start with your statistic, whatever data you got from your sample, and then you add and subtract a margin of error. Now this looks ugly. I'm not saying this is pretty to look at, but this is the margin of error. So everything after the plus or minus is the margin of error. And back at the top of this, I had just said, oops, this timed out. I said, let's pretend this was 17%. If my margin of error was 2%, that means my upper bound for my confidence interval would have been um, 19%. If my margin of error is 2%, my lower bound would have been 15%, right? So I'm always just adding or subtracting some number. Again, I made this up. We're about to find out what it really is. I just totally made this up. Um, but that's, that's what a margin of error is. It has a critical value and a standard error in it. Okay, so let's, let's go plug in our numbers for our problem. So for P prime, I'm gonna put 0.167. All right, so I'm gonna put 0.167 here, here, and here. We know our N is 750, but we need to find the Z star. All right, and anytime you wanna find a Z star, you go to yet another table. I know there's a lot of tables we're pulling from in here. But if you remember from the last example, your Z star critical values are always on the bottom row here. So we know we're on the bottom row. We just have to figure out what column we're in. And let's see if they give us a confidence level. Um, in a moment, I'll go look at the, the problem. If they give us a confidence level, great, we'll use that. The default confidence level is always 95%. That is the industry standard. So if I don't explicitly say it's a 99 or a 98 or a 97% confidence interval, just default to 95. That's, that's, our, that's our industry standard. Okay. So let's see what we got. Did I give you one here? Yes, I did. So go ahead and let's get the 90% confidence interval. All right. So if I want the 90% confidence interval, I'm gonna go along to the column where I see 90%, and I'm gonna see this number of 1.645. So for this problem, I'm gonna use 1.645. All right, so I've got all my numbers. Let me go write this out and see what we're working with. So I've got 0.167 plus or minus 1.645. Well, you know what, I didn't really give myself enough room. Let me rate that a little lower. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this um, one step at a time, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my calculator to check my work. Okay, so I'll go through this the long way, and I want you to hear that if you wanted to jump right from here to the actual confidence interval from your calculator, that's fine, but I wanna go through it since this is our only, this is just our second time doing it together, I wanna make sure I go through every step. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out what my margin of error is first. So I wanna figure out this quantity. All right, so let's, I'm gonna start inside the parentheses. I'm gonna do 0.167 times one minus 0.167. Now keep in mind, since I'm using the decimal round off and not the exact fraction, I'm gonna have a slight um, discrepancy between the answer I'm about to calculate and what my um, calculator output will give us in a moment. And I'll show you what I mean. So I've got that number, I'm gonna divide that by 750. I need to take the square root of that number, and then I need to multiply that by 1.645. All right, so I was guessing before that we had a 2% margin of error. It's, it's slightly larger, right? It's about a 2.2% margin of error. And since I'm going with this three decimal thing, I'll go 0.022 here. So we're gonna have 0.167 plus or minus 0 0.022. So let me go see what my numbers are. And then keep in mind, this is just gonna be slightly different from when I plug it into my calculator function. 
So we've got 0.167 plus 0.022, which would be about 0.189. And then I've got 0.167 minus 0.022, which would be about 0.145. So based on my number calculations, I would say my confidence interval is from 0.145 to 0.189. All right, so basically what I'm saying here is my sample proportion was about 0.167, all right? So about 16.7% of my sample wanted to hit a coworker. And I think if I ran the census, the true proportion would be somewhere between 14.5% and about 18.9%. So another way of saying is I, I don't, I think less than 20% of folks uh, that are employed full-time want to hit a colleague, which is great, um, especially for those of you who are employed full-time. Um, and this is all fine and good, all right? In a moment, we'll interpret it, but I also want us to remember how our calculator could really just help us out of that. Now, I'm going to move my calculator for a moment, and then I want us to look back at this flow chart I gave you. And I want you to see that I have your calculator options here. So I put this, right, that really you want to go stat, tests, you want to use option A, and the first two entries must be whole numbers. So I put this little note here because sometimes folks will put um, a decimal up in this top number and it has to be a whole number. Okay, so with that, let's do stat test A and see what the calculator answer would be. All right, so let me clear all this out. We're gonna hit stat. I'm gonna go over to test. Now you can scroll up or down. I'm gonna go up because I think it's less buttons to push. All right, so these first two entries have to be whole numbers. This one has to be your number of successes, right? Your frequency count. So I'm gonna do 125 and that was out of 750. Um, again, our default confidence level is 95, but I specifically asked for 90% here. So I'm going to hit enter in a moment. I'll scroll down to calculate. And keep in mind, um, I, I'm going to get numbers near this, potentially the exact same, but I did round off at three decimals um, for that sample proportion, so it might be a little different. So yeah, it's just slightly different, right? So the 0.189 stays, this was 0.144 according to my calculator, so it did have a slight decimal round off error. Um, since my calculator, this function is more accurate, I'm actually going to change this to 0.144. Okay. And just so you can see where the exact number would have been, if, if I had redone this with this number, my um, standard error would have been 125 out of 750 times 1 minus 125 out of 750. Right? I would have divided that number by 750. I would have square rooted that number. I would have multiplied it by 1.645. Oh gosh, it's really close, right? So my stand, my margin of error is still 0.022. I think last time I did it, this was a four, and I get that I would round up to a four, all of that. You, you can see that if you do the three decimal round off, you get pretty darn close numbers. And I, I'm just gonna reset it to the calculator function output because it's slightly more accurate, but we're almost splitting hairs here because we're talking about a 10th of a percent. All right, so just to review this, right? If I go to alpha A, right, we had all of those 90% confidence level. If I hit enter, I'm looking at 0.144 to 0.189. All right, so that's all great. We're still not done with this problem, okay? So the thing that I still need us to do is interpret it. And we do have two interpretations. We're gonna do the interpretation for the confidence interval, and then we're gonna do the interpretation for the confidence level. So let's see what we would plug in for this confidence interval. So we would say we are blank percent confident that P, the true proportion of something, is between this number and this number. So let's go fill this in for what we have right now. We were 90% confident that P, this was the true proportion of full-time employees that were so angered in the last year they wanted to hit a colleague, right? We thought it was between 14.4% and 18.9%. So I'm gonna take that template and I'm just gonna fill in my, my answers for this particular problem. So let's scooch down here. I'll, I'll move this up, okay. So for the interpretations, I'll do, I'll interpret the interval first. All right, 
right, so we are 90% confident that our parameter P, so we are 90% confident that P, again, this is the number that the only way we could get this number would be to run a census, and we don't really want to do that. So we are 90% confident that P, the true proportion, and I'm going to use these words, right, of full-time workers, so angered, oh, you can't see them. Let me scoot that down. I'm going to use the words that were given to me in the problem. So I'm going to do the true proportion of full-time workers so angered in the last year that they wanted to hit a colleague. I don't want to have to make the words up on my own, so I'm just going to use what was given to me. So the true proportion of full-time workers so angered in the last year that they wanted to hit a colleague All right. is between and what were our numbers? It was 14.4, the units on it are percentages because we're in proportion land, and 18.9%. Okay. So I've got my confidence interval interpreted. We still want to interpret the confidence level. So let's take a look at the the template for the confidence level. So we used a method to construct the estimate of P that in the long run will successfully capture P 90% of the time. Okay, And this is, as I said before, this is the law of large numbers applying to this confidence interval. So what I mean by that is we have a confidence interval and there's a chance the parameter's in here and then there's a chance that it's not. And we don't know if we got a good interval or a bad interval. Right? So again, P is either in here Right, the parameters in here, it's not, those are, it's binary. Did a good job, didn't do a good job. But the method I used works about 90% of the time. And when I say the law of large numbers, it means if I took another random sample of 750 folks and constructed an interval, and another random sample of 750 folks and constructed an interval, and another sample, and another interval, and I created confidence interval after confidence interval after confidence interval after confidence interval. Imagine you had like 100 of these. And they wouldn't all be the exact same numbers. They might be close. But if you had about 100 of these, we're saying about 95 capture the parameter and about 5% don't. We mess up about 5% of the time. All right, so with that, let me, let me scooch this up and then we'll write up this last interpretation. So we used a method to construct the estimate of P All right. that in the long run will successfully capture P 90% of the time. And I really want you to just pay attention to some of the words here, right? Estimate of P. This is our guess for the parameter. I am estimating. I am taking a statistic and estimating a parameter. And I am estimating that the parameter is somewhere between 14.4 and 18.9, all right? And then in the long run, right? This is the law of large numbers, meaning if I repeated this process again and again and again and again and again, that about 90 of my, I think I said 95% before. In this case, excuse me, it would have been 90%. If I repeated this process again and again and again and again and again, 90% of my intervals are good and about 10% are bad. Yeah, I'm almost sure I said 95.5 before because I get, 
Um, I get so used to the industry standard of 95%. So I, I apologize for that, but this is 90%. So again, imagine you had a hundred of these intervals, right? You repeated this process a lot, which would take forever. Uh, well, not forever, but a long time. So if you had about a hundred intervals, then about 90% of them are going to be good. And when I say they're good, that's my way of saying that the parameter was in here, that if I ran the census, I did a good job. And about 10% have an error rate. Okay. So the last thing I wanna do before we get out of here is I want us to think about what number is in the middle of this interval. I mentioned this last time, but it, it's always worth repeating. So if we take a look at this, right? And I'm just gonna draw this to the side here. If I was going to draw a little P prime axis, right? And we had 0.144 down here at the bottom and 0.189 towards the top. Again, it's an X axis, but it's labeled with P prime because we're dealing with proportions for this problem. So if I was dealing with proportions for this problem, Let's find out what number is dead set in the middle. So I'm gonna say, what's 0 0.144 plus 0 0.189 divided by, oops, that's bad math, sorry. Let me delete that, take that, then divide it by two. What number is right in the middle? And you can see it, the number in the middle is 0.167. And I hope that makes sense just on a, on a how, how did we construct it um, lens, right? 0.167 should be the middle. And then I added 2.2% to get over here and I subtracted 2.2% to get over here, right? This is always plus my margin of error, right? This is always minus my margin of error. And you can imagine if I had the bell curve over here, what we're saying is that about 90% of our observations would be this far from the center. All right, and this is on our sampling distribution and it relates back to chapter seven, but about 90% of the area under this curve would be between 0.144 and 0.189 if it was centered at 0.167 with the standard error of whatever this number would have been. Okay. All right, so that is our second look at our confidence interval for proportions. We're going to try a multiple choice question next. See you in a bit. Bye.